I want to uh, just introduce here, uh, or introduce our guests here in a second, but uh, give you. Well, I guess I'm not actually introducing our no, guests. No. Okay, never mind. Good. I didn't, prepare, <laughs> I didn't prepare for that. So um, I'm going to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Michael Kaufman, and I work for Health and Hospital Corporation, and I'm one of the founders and collaborators in the We Are City project. And um, so, um, We Are City is a a very loose organization that uh, tries to advance the dialogue around city building both here and beyond and um, and so we do this in three ways we have something called the we are city briefing which is a twice weekly email that goes out and uh, talks about city issues both locally and then internationally uh, if you are not on that email list you can sign up at wearecity.us and then the other way we do this is through a summit that we have each year called the we are city summit and that will be happening August 22nd at the Indiana History Center. There's a much longer name for that place that I can never remember, uh, but that will be uh, from noon to five on the Thursday, the 22nd. And we have people coming in from um, um, from all over talking about things ranging from uh, video games and how they relate to city building. And uh, we have a, a, land, a really great landscape architect who's coming in from New York. and. So it's a it's a really a hodgepodge of topics, but it makes for a very interesting conference or summit. And then we also are just launched uh, We Are City Import, which is a short-term residency program where we bring in people from other cities to come and live in Indianapolis for a, a month or so and do projects here in the city. And so our first resident was actually a gentleman named Zoe who was here uh, last in the November, I guess. We did a project with Butler University looking at the uh, the, the the critters in the canal, um, and and did a video, he's a video artist by trade, but worked with some of the some of the biologists at Butler. And then now we have James Reeves, who you'll learn about more shortly. Um, and so. Um, Please uh, stay connected to us and, and find out what we're doing. I want to thank our generous supporters of We Are City, uh, especially the Import, which is uh, Central Indiana Community Foundation, uh, Mill House, and their Mazo apartment building. So they are actually providing us a space for these residents, which is really great. Um, and also Zesco Restaurant Services helped us outfit the place. And then Osborne and Stillman, Stillman uh, helped us with some really beautiful furniture in the space. And, and then Indiana Humanities, who's helping with this event, is also a supporter. And then IUPUI's Arts and Humanities Institute. So a very special thanks to them for helping us make this happen. So I'm going to turn it over to Brandon. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, as I look around and see some of my friends, I feel a little silly introducing myself. But, um, for those who don't know me, my name is Brandon Judkins, and I'm the director of programs at Indiana Humanities. Uh, on behalf of Indiana Humanities, our friends at We Are City, uh, the Indianapolis Foundation slash CICF, which has also very generously sponsored this conversation and other ones in the series, uh, and our friends at Indy Read Books, welcome to In Conversation. To say a few words about In Conversation, it's a program that we designed named by Krista Skidmore, <laughs> to, uh, to try and capture all this really interesting national talent that comes through our city, these really innovative people, and bring them together in small groups and a question and answer style discussion moderated by a really talented local thought leader. Um, the way I like to describe it is it's inside the actor's studio, but instead of actors, we have people who are actually making a difference in the world. Um, hey, hey. 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 Whoa. Wow, that one, that one usually goes over better. Uh, what we also do within conversation is our good friends at Queen Size always record the audio from these conversations and create a podcast. Uh, and our friend Joe in the back with Heron is uh, taking what we like to call visual notes of our conversation. And when we have our podcast together and our visual capture of the conversation, we'll email all of you and make sure you've got that uh, to take with you. Today's conversation is moderated by Krista Skidmore. Krista is uh, co-founder of Flashpoint, which is a forward-looking human resources firm that develops leadership and creative talent here in the city. But we brought Krista here because she spends her spare time with organizations from the Arts Council to Indiana Humanities, developing a reputation as one of the most thoughtful leaders in the Indianapolis creative community. And the focus of our conversation today is going to be James Reeves. Now, I'd like to keep these things short, but James sort of defies brief introduction. I think I've seen in various places that James is a author, photographer, historian, designer, educator, and I'm sure there are other some cliched labels that fit James's work really well. But uh, one of the more intriguing bits that 
I've seen from James and a, a book I got for Christmas from one of my colleagues. Uh, it's James' first book, A Road to Somewhere, an American Memoir, which is a really innovative capture and combination of photographs and essays that attempts to tell the story and I think really capture what it means to be an American. Um, I wanted to read a really brief review that I saw of A Road to Somewhere. A Road to Somewhere is a tantalizing 21st century cross-section between James Eggie's Let Us Now Praise Famous Men and Jack Kerouac's On the Road. This remarkable and utterly original memoir heralds the arrival of a new and important American voice. James Reeves' The Road to Somewhere will take you places you will not easily forget. James, as I understand it, and Michael can chime in, or James can chime in if I'm selling it short, but James is here as part of the We Are City project that he described, and as I understand the work, is going to spend his month here in part capturing photographs and writings about Indianapolis to spark conversations about how we think about our places and who we are as a city. Today's conversation is completely flexible, and we really hope to engage as many of you as possible. This is a back and forth. Chris still asks some questions, but everybody, please feel free to chime in, and we can go any direction that interests you. But I suspect that we'll lean heavily today on our sense of place and what it is that makes Indianapolis special. And pardon the pandering, but I think this is a good crowd for this conversation, because as I look around, I think that a lot of the people that make this a neat and exciting place to be here in the room. So with that, Kristen James. <laughs> well, welcome. It's good to see everyone. Uh, so many friends in the room um, and made some new ones already. So uh, welcome. And uh, as Brandon said, uh, know that both James and I are flexible to interrupt if you've got a question at any point. Uh, but let me give you a little bit of a roadmap so you can know um, where we're headed and where it might be most appropriate uh, for questions to be interjected. So we're really breaking this into two parts. The first part uh, of our time will focus on uh, the book, The, the Road to Somewhere. Uh, I don't know if anyone had a chance to when they came in, but um, the images from the book are, are on the wall, which most of you can't <coughs> see over here. So if you haven't had a chance to look at them, please be sure to, to catch that photography on, on the way out. Um, there's some really vivid in, images, and I agree, ones that you won't forget. Um, as uh, as I, I read the book, I had the opportunity to, um, to dig in and get to know James, although um, I told him he was a bit of a disadvantage because uh, I know a lot more about him than um, he about me. Uh, so, uh, but we'll focus first 30 minutes just talking about some of the key themes from the book, and then we'll transition. Well, any questions that you might have about the book or his travels or any want him to share any other anecdotes that he doesn't cover, we can do that. But then we'll transition to talk a little bit about um, his work with cities, um, his work with the Civic Center in New Orleans, and. Um, and ultimately, we want to have an open dialogue with all of you while you're here about what you think uh, makes Indianapolis unique, but also about how you think uh, others outside of Indianapolis perceive us. Uh, that relates a lot to the project that James will be doing while he's here through import on, uh, with We Are City. So we'll talk a little bit more about that coming up, but that's really where we're headed. Two parts. Sound good? All right. Well, I want to, since I referenced the photography already, I wanted to start there. Um, so the book is a five-year journey, 55,000 miles all across the country. Uh, you experienced a lot along the way. But I first wanted to start with the images. I mean, the book is certainly filled with a lot of images. Um, and I'm, I'm curious, you could have taken pictures of a lot of things, but you chose and I'll let you describe your primary subject, but um, why why these pictures, and why why did these things stand out to you? Um, I'm not sure. That's a good question. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I I've drove... stumped him already. <laughs> <laughs> good. Well, it was a gotcha question, but in it. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't know if you can see them up here, but I, I, you know, I drove and I just started taking photos. I didn't have any intention of writing a book. I was just jotting things down to help me understand. I started. I took the. I started driving in 2004 when I was living in New York and Bush was reelected. And New York is kind of a bubble. And that was where that narrative really came up of uh, the real America and Main Street USA and, you know, like this idea of the real America. And so I was like, well, I should go see it. And so I just started driving around. I had this sort of political idea of like, well, I want to understand like why people would vote for this guy and like why there's like this sort of polarization that seems to be really happening in the country. Um, over time, so whenever I could, I would just rent a car and drive around. 
Um, and I would just look at a map and be like, I'm going to go to Dinosaur, Colorado, because who didn't go to Dinosaur, Colorado? <laughs> um, and I got really, over time I got really interested in kind of the white spaces on the map, like the Nevada test site or these areas that, you know, <laughs> just strange things are happening, and I mean, particularly the desert. I mean, there's just so much random stuff happening in the desert. I met some guy who's stealing highway signs taking the reflective covering and building solar-powered bikes, and he's like 78, living by the Salton Sea in this abandoned town called Bombay Beach, and you know, just, no one's really paying attention out there, so you can kind of do what you want. Um, yeah, everyone kind of seems to be on like plan B, and they're just like really open, you know, I don't know. So I got really captivated by kind of like the junkyards and American ruins, you know, that were out there, and slowly my shift became very much less political, and a lot more about the American landscape, and particularly like these old abandoned main streets, and then just how I would have these moments where I would, you know, wake up at a Super 8 motel and see like a Walmart and a Walgreens, and be like, I think I'm in New Mexico, but I could be in Pennsylvania or any others, you know, just the consistency of it as well. Um, so I really started focusing on buildings, and only later on did I realize, like, okay, you've got this sort of ruined porn thing going on where you're really interested in. <laughs> You know, these sort of abandoned structures, particularly beautiful old band, uh, buildings, you know, that it's just, I feel like we're all kind of complicit in letting them sort of decay and go unused, and I really want to try to find ways to restore attention to them. Mm -hmm. Well, it's an interesting subject matter, I think. You know, I was, as I was going through the book, I, I thought to myself, if I had gone on the same journey as you, I, I would never have taken the same pictures, and, you know, I think a lot of like, sort of our formative years as well as some of the experiences we have really shape images that are beautiful to us, right? Um, and you've captured a number that uh, I would have never thought of, and I think that's a really powerful thing. So a core th uh, sort of thesis of the book is um, not only what it means to be an American, but I think what it means to be a man um, in America uh, was something that was really central that you sort of start out with and then continue to explore. So I'm, I'm just, I'm curious, you know, you, you talk a lot about how being a man used to be really simple. You would go to war, come back, get a job, have a family, retire from likely the same company that you went to work for to begin with, right? Uh, that was certainly your grandfather's experience. Um, and then um, things began to change, you know, offshoring uh, of jobs began to happen a lot more. Your father's experience with work was very different. So I was wondering if you could think about your experience and maybe describe how you would compare and contrast that to what you just, you know, discovered about your grandfather and your father. Yeah. Um, so my full name is James Augustus Reeves III, which sounds like I should have money. And my great, or my grandfather worked at Sears for his entire, and I mean, he landed in Normandy, you know, was one of those guys who was like, you know, we should have gotten Stalin, and you know, was this very, like, just kind of greatest generation guy who then came back, got his business degree on the GI Bill, worked at Sears in Chicago, and um, retired with a great plan, became, like, mayor of his little town in Michigan, and, you know, just had this sort of, like, very structured life. Um, always really believed in, well, until the end of his life, um, when we started getting into stranger wars. But, you know, he really believed in, you know, the military. He believed in companies that would take care of you. My dad worshipped him, and except his war was Vietnam. And then he came back and worked in the same building as my grandpa at the Sears mm. Tower. And then he went and worked for Sears. And his job was outsourced to China in 1980. And my dad never really recovered from that, because he was like, well, I played by the rules, and I did what I was supposed to do. And, you know, then he kind of just kind of moved from retail job to retail job. And then for me, I've you know never been in the military. I did work at Sears for eight weeks in the lighting department. And it was kind of awful. Um, and actually, I, ceiling fans. Is all like that. Yeah, it was like ceiling right, fans right. and lighting. Um, but I've had 28 jobs, so I'm definitely kind of a dilettante and trying to figure out what I want to do. And, I've, and I'm at the point now that I've kind of always worked for myself. And just kind of comparing that difference, as well as the fact that my grandfather drove across the country in... I think it was 39 to see the World's Fair. So that was before there were highways, you know. And he actually uh, got, I think it was like $20 in standard oil coupons to drive a car for an auto dealer from uh, Detroit to San Francisco. <laughs> and he's always like, and I still had $2 left by the time I got there. <laughs> and I was like, oh. Slept on the beach and hitchhiked home to Chicago with a bathing suit salesman. And, you know, just... <laughs> And so my road trip experience was very different. <laughs> so I think just kind of seeing those shifts, but I do feel like there's this sense of, 
things are a lot more atomized now, you know, and I don't, I'm not trying to at all sound nostalgic for the past. I want to be very, very clear about that. Like, it's, I think it's easy to kind of put that on a pedestal and say things are wonderful and great. They were, particularly for a lot of people. Um, but I do think there was a sense of like a kind of cohesive narrative. Even if people were reacting against it, you know, there was this still narrative of like, serve your country, start a family and get a job and they're gonna take care of you. you know. And even if you were saying, I'm not gonna do any of those things, there's still this thing to react against or to follow. And I feel like now the narrative is just really scattered, which I think opens up a great opportunity for you know finding your own way and doing different things. But at the same time, I think it can be a little overwhelming or paralyzing maybe, mm -hmm. which is why I ended up going to law school for a year. And, you know. Yeah. Well, and so building on that, you not only law school, but you pursued a lot of other lifelong learning, I suppose, in a lot of different ways from design to law. So I'm curious as you, maybe you could describe sort of the different disciplines that you have studied and maybe which ones have shaped your thought processes in different ways. Yeah, it was in high school that I realized I liked to write. And so I was like, I'm going to be a writer and then I'm going to get an English degree. I had no idea what that meant. Um, so I was like, I'll do something specific. So I started majoring in Japanese literature and translation. Which is really because yeah. that made sense. <laughs> I was like, I'll get to travel, and then I, you know, it was really hard, and I didn't like it. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, I kept switching my major, and it's one of those things where, like, I think I've always just kind of gone with what I'm interested in, both to my detriment, you know, as kind of being a bit of a dilettante. But then in the rearview mirror, it's like, oh, okay, well now that makes sense. I see what I'm interested in. So there's no way I would have ever been. I'm going to move to New Orleans and get an old abandoned iron factory and start an urban design studio and drive around the country and write. You know, like that just wasn't on my radar. Um, so I ended up going into play, going from Japanese literature and tra translation to playwriting. Really didn't like the theater. Went to film and video. Really didn't like working with other people. So then I went into graphic design, <laughs> <laughs> which was an a flashpoint because I saw the like propaganda posters from um, you know the, for the Eisenstein films, the Stenberg brothers and Alexander Rachenko, and like you know these guys got you know drummed out of the country. They were put into a gulag. You know, like mm -hmm. just seeing like the power of design. Actually, you know, typographers being walked to the border of Germany. And I'm just thinking, like, wow, it has such a political history. And so I got really interested in graphic design. Unfortunately, my undergraduate education really trained me to get a job on Madison Avenue, which I did. Um, I moved to New York in August of 2001, yeah, and was promised a job three weeks later, um, September 11th, and then the job went away. And you know, I was scanning toothpaste ads for competitors to see who else was marketing toothpaste ads. It was this really strange time. Um, but then I eventually worked on Madison Avenue, and I just hit this point that I was like, I don't care if, I, if another cell phone or widget is sold. I can't believe I'm doing this. And I had this moment where I was like, working at 10 o'clock at night in a skyscraper and I just saw all these other people pixel pushing and I was like, I don't want to do it. And so I went and I was frustrated with my education and the fact that I overlooked the political history of design. So I went and got a master's in design education at Pratt and I started teaching design history and really focusing on design as kind of a political process and it's a process of empowerment. And that, then I started a studio, which initially started as a record label because I was from Detroit and I was a techno nerd, but eventually just started focusing on design. And over the time, I started focusing more and more on cities, and I started doing these drives. And um, then we renamed it Civic Center, and I realized, okay, I can write and I can do design, but it's really like the law people who have the power. And after my mom passed away, she always wanted to be a lawyer, so I was like, I'll try applying to law school. And I was like, how do I do that? You know. <laughs> so like, I went and got the LSAT practice test, and I had this idea that I was just going to take it and discover I'm a genius. And I was like, it was so You'll hard. You finally it's, found your calling. It was humiliating. You were just like, you're never, you know. So I kept studying it and practicing it, and then I got offered an opportunity to go to law school in Tulane, which was amazing. Um, then I got the offer, given my ac kind of patchy academic career. Um, <laughs> And I went there for a year and um, just saw someone's like, I don't want a life of conflict. <laughs> and I think maybe I was a little too old for it, but yeah, it was just, um, yeah, I just really wanted to learn about cities and so on, but the pressure and everything was curved. And I would ask a teacher, you know, like, can, I, can you explain this to me? And like, oh, I can't explain that to you because it's curved and would be fair to the other students. I'm like, but I just want to learn this. And you know what? I'm going to go on a rant about law school and I shouldn't do that. So but anyway, writing and the design thing happened in New Orleans and it's a great place to be. So it just kind of ended up there. I don't know if that answered the question. I feel like I just talked yeah, about I, it. I, I, I think it did. Yeah. And I, you know, it's interesting. I think um, it, when you do look in the rear view mirror, things do sort of fit together yeah, in sort now, of a, a patchwork. Um, although at the time, sometimes as we're going through, we don't necessarily always see that. So 
a little bit of a, um, a shift in gears. Uh, one of the chapters that um, that you have in the book is focused on God, and you certainly experienced um, a lot of of that as you crossed the country from billboard signs to uh, AM radio scanning. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and I wanted to read just a, a quick passage that you wrote on belief. Uh, because I think it's uh, particularly uh, interesting, your perspective, and then I'll I'll have a little follow-up question for you. So belief. Sometimes I hear church bells ringing, and I'm surprised by how much they comfort me. A call for ritual, a desire for order. I envy the devout. I admire religion as an attempt to seek some kind of moral pattern in a scary world. But I refuse to accept it. My rejection is nearly physical. I have trouble understanding people who believe in magic, chakras, and ghosts. But why I am so agnostic toward anything spiritual? Well, my interior life probably pales in comparison to a monk's. I would like to pray or meditate, but I can't sit still. Yet it feels better to believe in something bigger than ourselves, so why not? Why not take comfort in the idea that one day we might see the ones we've lost? Because I worry that faith is a form of denial, because I believe that it's a stubborn refusal to turn on the lights. I do not think this is a good quality of mine. You're probably like, did I write that? (laughs) It's been been a little while now. (laughs) So, you know, there's a picture over here, God, guns, guts. Made America. Let's keep all three. Um, that's one of the, the, the <laughs> photographs that was, you know, just uh, up. So I'm just, I'm curious as you reflect on probably a, a huge patchwork of ideas about God and um, what that means. Where are you today? What does it mean to you? Um, does that resonate with you? What you wrote? Uh, it does, and I'm really in some sort of twilight. I guess I was then too, but I'm really in sort of a twilight right now, or in between moment. I mean, because that sounds a little bit harsher than maybe I feel right now. Mm-hmm. Well, um, it's a it's a sort of continuum, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it is. I mean, at, at the time, two things were really going on. One was that I was driving around the country, just addicted to AM radio. <laughs> and you know I just lost my like, I was living in Helsinki and my mom passed away very suddenly I mean she was sick and so I was like okay I'm going to rent a car for six weeks she's going to be fine I'll take care of her and so on and then you know four days after I got back to the US to be with her she passed away very suddenly and so suddenly I had a car for six weeks Helsinki wasn't home I didn't have a home in New York I didn't know where to go so I just stayed on the road for six weeks and mm-hmm. Um, I, I wrote that during that time because you know you lose somebody that you love for the first time, and just, particularly the way mm-hmm. that she passed away, it's just you, know, you just get mad at the universe and don't understand, you know. And then I'm seeing all these, you know, this endless tape loop of you know Baptist church signs and things saying everything, you know. And I just started to really have this antagonism <clears throat> um, that twinned with being addicted to AM radio, which had a lot to do with. And only in retrospect do I realize because. While I was in Helsinki was when the whole healthcare thing was going on, and so the way that was reported in Helsinki, which everyone has like amazing free healthcare there, you know, it was all the signs of Americans like keep your Marxist hands off my Medicare, you know, all that <laughs> stuff. And so that conversation was happening, and I think, you know, the way that I lost my mom, or when you lose somebody that you love, and you're like, what could I have done differently? And it's just like, how responsible are we for one another? And you know, I'm always going to be mad at myself for not being. I just feel like I could have done something different or been closer to her. You know, it's just something that you do. Can you really change another person? These are questions that you start asking yourself. For me, it was much easier to think about it on this national level as the healthcare <laughs> debate was going on about how responsible are we for one another. So that's why I got addicted to the political radio. And I hit a point that I was like, okay, fine. I pulled over the car in Salt Lake City and like bought a copy of Atlas Shrugged. I'm like, I'm going to figure this out. <laughs> like, I want to understand both sides, right? Like, I want to think of it rationally. And I read half of it, and by the time, like, you know, the other character's looking scornfully at another, and you know, I just couldn't, it's like, this is just bad writing. I can't feel it. But I just really wanted to understand where it came from, because I'm listening to things where it's like, you know, these sort of calm and they're talking about Jesus and God, but at the same time, they're saying things like, well, we don't need to have another coat drive, because that's just teaching kids, what happened to last year's coats? It's just teaching kids that they get free coats every year. And I'm like, there's cold children, what are you doing, you know? 
<laughs> so anyway, I was kind of in that headspace when I wrote that. Yeah. Um, now I'm changing a little bit, and it's really weird that you're asking me that, because I guess I'll just be honest, I'm going through a whole recovery thing, and my sponsor's just like, you know, did you pray this morning? <laughs> I'm just like, I try, I get down on my knees, and I just try to go through the motions. But one thing that he said is, you know, spirituality is a discipline. <laughs> And that's something that I'm really trying to hang on to right now because yeah, I have this whole thing. And I realized a lot of that book, and just in general, is like driving around the country, like looking for some sort of white light experience. You know, I'd have mm. these moments where I'm like, okay, I'm going to play the perfect song. I'm going to stand at the edge of the Grand Canyon because mm. they do that in the movies, you know. And the, you know, this, I'm just like, you just watch too much TV, like, you know. But I had these ideas that I would somehow figure something out and I started to feel more comfortable, and it just didn't really happen. So. I don't know that answered the question no. again, but so I don't think I'm as harsh as I was yeah. at that time, but I'm still like kind of perplexed by how religion is used as a cudgel to mm-hmm. alienate people, particularly mm-hmm. on a political level. It's really I think it's a very loud minority, um, and that conversation in America just really frightens me. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, like I'm realizing more and more that I need to find something and you know put some effort because it's just as as much as I get frustrated with people wielding religion like a weapon in some ways, you know, and think that's ignorant, I think it's just as ignorant to say, well, all this is wrong and I'm not going to believe it. So I'm just kind of in this weird limbo right now. I don't know how long I'll stay there. Journey. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so you mentioned the loss of your mom, and so early on in the book, you, um, you happen upon uh, Price Tower, which is... Um, Frank Lloyd writes only skyscraper in the middle of nowhere in, what is it, Bartlesville, Oklahoma, maybe? Bartlesville, Oklahoma, yeah. yeah. Um, it was originally designed to be in Manhattan, and um, but then was put out in the middle of nowhere. So I, I would love first for you to talk just a little bit about the experience of coming on something like that in that kind of place. Um, but then you, you, you wind up a little later going back to that place, so... It's like one of these, it was, well, first of all, I should say it's interesting to talk about right now because the apartment I'm in, the, there's furniture from this amazing group called ONS, right? Um, they brought in a desk and chairs, and it's all triangles, and like, like triangle chairs, triangle desk corners and everything. Mm-hmm. I'll get to that in a moment, but I feel like I'm actually in the Price Tower. Um, <laughs> but, okay, the reason that it really stuck out to me is like, I mean, you're in the, they call it the, a tree, it was called, the, the building is called a tree without a forest or something like that, and it's. Basically, Frank Lloyd Wright always wanted to design a skyscraper. That was something he always wanted to do as an architect. And for some reason, he just was never able to, because he was so, businesses didn't like working with him. Because he had such a strong personality. Okay. Yeah. So he had the opportunity to build one on the Bowery. And I think it was in the 30s, I'm not 100%, but I think it was like the Depression hit or something, you know, and the financing fell through. So he had this plan for it. And then later on, the uh, somebody associated with, his name was Price, but was associated with Philip 66 Oil in Oklahoma, was a huge Frank Lloyd Wright fan, you know, commissioned him to build this uh, skyscraper. And what's crazy is, like, it's all open prairie. And Frank Lloyd Wright didn't even bother to change the design. He made this nice, compact little skyscraper exactly as he designed it to be sandwiched in on the Bowery. So it's like, really narrow thing. The reason I was really drawn to it was just because, you know, you're driving around the Great Plains of Oklahoma, and all of a sudden you just see this thing, you know? And that, to me, just kind of sums up the amazing thing about America in general. It's just... And for me, driving out with all these assumptions of like, oh, small towns are going to be like this, and this region's like that, and all of a sudden you're like, I did not expect to find this like, you know, amazing Frank Lloyd Wright piece in the middle of the prairie. And I go there, and like the whole community is really like psyched about it. And then, <laughs> at the time, I don't know if it's still happening, but it was crazy. It was like, you know, these, you know, older women who were just like sitting, you know, one of them had the I Hate Mondays like sweater on, and she was just like, I love Zaha Hadid. I'm going to tell you about her. Like we're getting her to do an extension of it, you know. And this whole town was like really into architecture and art. And they have all its original drawings and so on. And I would not have expected that. So just that sort of like moment was really cool for me, and it just made me feel very good and reassured somehow. And the building itself, like Frank Lloyd Wright was going through his triangle phase, so it's all triangles. The building's shaped like a triangle. The elevators are shaped like triangles. And I mean, and particularly in the Midwest, and people are a little bit, but like you're getting in the elevator, and it's like this because it's designed for one person. And at the top is like the um, the office for Price when he when he when he worked there. And, and, and every room is a triangle, the showers are triangles, the desks are triangles, and there's little triangle wastebaskets that go into the leg of the desk. Mm-hmm. And it's all triangles. And <laughs> Price had a globe, a big globe in the middle of his office. And Frank Lloyd Wright would literally show up and like hide it behind the door. <laughs> 
<laughs> so anyway, the, the, just the general beauty and insanity of an amazing American architect, plus like this town that's just really trying to become kind of like an archive for this work, as well as just bring great architecture internationally to Bartlesville, Oklahoma, which sits right across the street from the Philip 66 Museum. It's just all of that schizophrenia, like in one place, I just really dug it, and there's something really reassuring about it to me. Yeah. So um, after you lost your mom, you set back on, on the road, and you described the tower as a beacon um, and went there. So what was it about that place that, is it the re, is it because it was reassuring to you in some way? Yeah, I just remember, like, discover, I mean, it wasn't, I didn't expect to find it, and then I just had such a great time there, and I um, was in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and then didn't know where to, you know, I was trying to figure out where to go after my mom passed away, and I just started driving south, and I was like, oh, I liked this one place. Like, that was, like, literally, I just started <laughs> swinging the car a little bit, like, west, and and up there. Yeah, it wasn't a very conscious decision, but when I just realized I was kind of in the neighborhood, meaning like 500 miles away, <laughs> I should <laughs> uh, um, So now, the book says you got a tattoo, at the risk of being a little L.A. ink. Um, what's the tattoo of, and why'd you get it? I got it in the Mojave Desert. Um, some kind of marine tattoo place. Uh, it just says Optimist here. That was the original name for... All right, I shouldn't get it all this. But the original name of the book was going to be The Awful Making of an Optimist, like me trying to feel good about the country and so on. <laughs> Publishers have other ideas. Um, Apparently the road to somewhere was better. <laughs> Not like all roads go somewhere. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. So... <laughs> Um, yeah, I just got Optimus tattooed here, but it had to be just right, you know, so I, like, had, like, you know, designer, you know, type, type nerd, so it was, like, Helvetica lowercase, perfectly kerned, and so on, and I was, like, you know, please, you know, and this guy's just, like, I got it, you know, <laughs> but, yeah, so I got that for, like, like $28, $30 or something in the Mojave Desert. Yeah. So, the first roughly 350 pages, on page 349, you say, you, I do not know how to stop this book. And actually, when I read that page, I'm like, I knew it! I knew <laughs> I knew I knew it. Kind of like yeah, yeah. Um, but the last 50 pages, I feel like, are just such a juxtaposition to the other 350, roughly. Um, at least that was my perspective as a reader. Um, in fact, you end the book saying... You love, you lose, you regret, you get scared. You do your best to keep your head together and find something to hang on to. Um, and, you know, it probably relates to the quest of optimism in some ways. But um, maybe just describe how you came to find meaning. Or perhaps it happened all the way along and there was a realization about it. But those last 50 pages are, from my perspective, very different than the first. Well, I mean, I think the book started off with the kind of foolish quest to think if I drive around enough and talk to enough people and see enough things, I'll figure everything out. And obviously, that, that life just doesn't really work that way. And it shouldn't. Um, but, you know, I think between all the paranoid AM radio chatter, driving around with Anne Rand, um, <laughs> and just this kind of sense of. I mean, everything's just so exaggerated. I mean, also for me, I mean, just being addicted to screens and the sort of sense of digital fatigue and there's just so much information coming at us and just generally feeling, like, kind of overwhelmed. And just... I think there's kind of a dark edge to the book, you know, for a while. And I remember when I was... When I actually then went out and kind of did the book tour, you know, and talking about, like, you know, we're, we're so schizophrenic and, you know, atomized and this, and people were like, can you just say something nice? <laughs> 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 and and I started to, you know, but what's interesting is, like, as I was driving around through a lot of empty main streets, you know, and three years later, I would go back and start to see these little banners, like, you know, come back to downtown Fairfield, or, you know, seeing, like, a lot of downtowns that were, like, really kind of revitalizing, which brings a whole other host of issues and difficulties, which you know, maybe we'll talk about later. But the fact that people are kind of returning to cities was super encouraging to me. And, I mean, even in New Orleans, like, they're talking about taking down part of the highway, you know, in favor of people. Like, there's this neighborhood that, um, the Treme that got bisected from the French Quarter, and it used to be, like, one of the wealthiest, like, African-American communities in the country. It had this beautiful boulevard of oak trees, and it was just absolutely gorgeous. One of the most heartbreaking things I've ever seen in the country is seeing, like, when they put I-10 right across it, obviously it amputated this community, and, you know, housing prices fell and it just kind of fell into in, in, into a really bad state for a while. Um, on the pillars holding it up, somebody went back and painted all the original oak trees that were there. Mm -hmm. 
And not like the city's talking about actually taking it down, which is amazing. I mean, just to have that conversation. Or 20 years ago, I don't think you'd be even near that conversation. And I really do hope that, like, in 30 or 40 years, like, we're going to look back and say, like, hey, remember after World War II where we all, like, went out into, like, the suburbs and had these crazy houses and didn't talk to each other? Like, that was weird. You know, like, I think, I think a lot of it can be undone. You know, and just seeing people come back to cities. My faith in a city is that they're supposed to be chaotic, diverse, and noisy places always changing. And that's where I started really started to focus on, like, Civic Center and this idea of, like, talking about cities. So that was kind of, I guess, my resting point for right now. Yeah. Well, you talk about that schizophrenia, and that will be a good segue to sort of our part two in talking a little bit more about cities. Uh, you write, and just a real quick passage, uh, so uh, you talk about schizophrenia is found in every American city. We accept poverty as a plain fact, a fundamental rule of the game, forgetting that there is a living, breathing mayor of the scene and a government that has done nothing to fix this city. No state of emergency has been declared. We continue to vote for this sort of negligence, and people like me will drive through it telling ourselves that there's, uh, that somehow this is just a fact of modern life. Nothing can be done about it. Unless it suddenly shows up uninvited on CNN after a hurricane, then we get indignant and pull out our checkbooks. Poverty happens all the time. It's just ratcheted up several notches in Detroit, which you spent some time in, where we've been promised a renaissance for decades. Even the city's key architectural feature is named after the idea. So, um, you know, you, this fundamental faith in cities and that maybe perhaps someday suburbs will be seen as a mistake. Um, I'm curious, just as you think about cities in general, I mean, you've, you've spent a lot of time in a lot of different ones. Um, how, how do you see that schizophrenia showing up in maybe Detroit first, New Orleans, you've, you know, certainly um, are spending quite a bit of time in now, and then maybe we'll move a little bit to Indianapolis. So. Well, yeah, I mean, I grew up just outside Detroit, so like eight miles kind of the boundary line, and I grew up on 10 Mile. And every time, like, my family drove two miles south, it was just like you locked the doors. And, you know, there's this, there, I grew up, and I think particularly after World War II and the 70s, 80s, and early 90s, there's this sort of demonization of cities, you know. And Detroit has always been, I think, the, the boogeyman in some ways of, like, the scariest city, you know, the sort of punchline of, like, you know, I'm going to go on vacation to Detroit or, you know, whatever. Like, it had this idea of, like, this is, like, the logical conclusion of, like, post-industrial America and so on. And I think people are always connecting Detroit to their weird Mad Max fantasies, which are totally inaccurate. Um, but it's interesting growing up, you know, near a city that's in such disarray, you know, and in such need. And, of course... I would sneak out whenever I could in high school and go to Detroit because I was just fascinated by the idea of a city. And it was interesting because then when I moved to New York and started teaching, it was October 30th, and I said to my class, like, oh, it's Devil's Night. And they're like, what's that? <laughs> I'm like, wait, well, it's like when everyone goes out and sets houses on fire. And they're like, what? And I'm like, oh, you don't do that. Okay. It, wasn't <laughs> it wasn't until I said it out loud. I was like, that's really insane. <laughs> to grow up with that is something that's just kind of like, well, here it comes again. You know? and, and it's gotten much better in Detroit, by the way. But I mean, at the, at the time, it was kind of hitting a peak. you know. And so, I mean, and, and I guess even with the idea of American ruins, like seeing like, so many beautiful abandoned buildings, I guess that kind of worked its way into me as well. Um, but yeah, I guess with the schizophrenia thing, it's just the sense of privilege versus poverty, you know? And I think we need to have like a lot of fearless discussions about how to have... Because I think a lot of times it gets boiled down to like anti-gentrification. I and mean, like in New Orleans, like it's such a small city that's constrained by the river and the lake. And so, and it's it's the fastest growing city right now. And there's people like me and people every week and meet somebody from New York or whoever who's moving down there because it's walkable, it's wonderful, it's an amazing city. It's pushing people out too. And that conversation is very, very heated right now in New Orleans. But it, a lot of times, it kind of, and I'm curious if that conversation happens in Indianapolis, but a lot of times it defaults to an anti-gentrification argument. Mm -hmm. And certainly gentrification brings a lot of bad things, like Walgreens. But I think that... Specifically. <laughs> <laughs> But it's frustrating when you hear a lot of arguments of like, well, we don't want to extend the streetcar, or we don't want to have this waterfront development because it's going to raise our property values. And when you follow that, lo that, converse, that logic to its logical conclusion, I think you end up saying, like, oh, we need to have shitty places for, for poor people to live, as opposed to the more troubling question of how do you give everybody economic mobility and equity to stay where they are or to move up, the, move up around. And we don't mm -hmm. have that conversation as much. It's starting to focus on just like signs of improvement being a threat. And it's, it's, it's I mean, I don't have any 
answer, but I feel that's where a lot of the schizophrenia comes in. Mm -hmm. And I mean, even just the conversation about poverty in cities and this disparity of wealth and with New Orleans, of course, it's so much easier to say, like, well, there was this federal disaster and there's this bright line drawn, and now look how it's coming back, as opposed to saying, well, we're coming back after 60 years of redlining, blockbusting, these horrible social policies, you know, like, completely, like, underfunding our school. I mean, those are not easy topics. They're very diffuse. They're very, you know, like, passive in some ways. They're just kind of always present. So I think New Orleans gets this comeback kid persona because we can just draw, draw a bright line and blame it on a hurricane. Um, whereas to talk about it in Detroit or any other American city, like I think it's a lot more of a difficult conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's sort of this um, ec equitable growth uh, is, and it's certainly a conversation that that um, I, I'm looking around the room. A number, uh, a number of us have had, and I think applies a lot to what's happening here um, in Indianapolis as well. But you're right. I mean, many of you I know have spent some time in New Orleans and. Um, I've spent some time with uh, Idea Village and all the whole entrepreneurial community. Um, I know many, uh, many of you have spent time um, looking at the education reform and charter, the rise of the charter uh, schools there. Um, yeah, but but it certainly does raise some more policy level decisions. So as you're coming back, who do we really want to be when we grow up and um, grow up again? I suppose, yeah, in some ways. So. If we could transition just a little bit and uh, maybe talk a little bit about how you're going to handle your project here in Indianapolis, and I know you want to get some feedback from uh, our audience on how we perceive ourselves and how we think others perceive us, as that will relate to the work you're doing. Yeah, I mean, so with a lot of the work that I do with my company, Civic Center, I mean, we're focusing on um, education programs, um, kind of like a restorative justice program for infrastructure improvements and so on. And largely through my partner and lady friend, Candy Chang, who's kind of definitely the star in the relationship. Like, we get like, a lot of um, a lot of press, and we're, you know, it's weird. It's just so strange that people are interested in the company, because it's like, we've only been in New Orleans for three years, and we're just doing these little things. Like, talk to these community groups that have been holding it down since the 70s. Mm -hmm. You know, like, why are you paying attention to us just because we have a what, you know. But we are doing these projects, and I'm interested in it, and we go to these, you know, there's all these conferences. I'm still trying to figure out how to talk about this in an elegant way, so I hope it doesn't come off. Like, I don't want to distance myself or imply anything negative about all the conversation about cities that's happening. The Atlantic Magazine has a cities blog. Everybody has a cities blog now. It's great. It's exciting to see people being good about it. But, but I also feel like there's a faith in technology to solve it and even art to solve it all. And... Yeah, you know, you're getting to a point now where it's just somebody's on a TED stage saying like sustainable city spontaneous intervention 3.0 or something, you know? And you're like <laughs> you're taking this basic Jane Jacobs idea or whatever and really dressing it up, you know, and acting like the gatekeeper of this information. And it's starting to get a little frustrating. I think there's a I, I'm glad that there's this conversation happening, but I think it also has these emperor has no clothes moments, you know, where it's just like, well, we'll just talk about it. If I tweak this enough, like it's going to make a difference or something. <laughs> And so I think a lot of times the conversation just gets reduced to this very kind of clinical discussion that doesn't take into account the personality of a city. And so we've been working on some projects in that neighborhood, and let me be clear. But like, so for this project in Indianapolis, um, my partner Oliver Blank, and who's going to come here in April, and um, you should definitely see him his accent and everything. He's very friendly and more <laughs> coherent than I am. Um, he is, so he and I are working on this project where it's going to be called the Bureau of Manufactured History. And what I'm particularly interested in is kind of the, the not factual stuff. Like the, you know, I talk about these abandoned buildings, you know. And I mean, growing up in Detroit, there was one that, you know, the uh, Central Michigan Railroad Station, which is just designed by the guy who did um, the Grand Central Station. It's beautiful, vaulted ceilings, gargoyles, and, you know, it's a beautiful Beaux Arts building. And growing up among all these rumors of, like, yeah, like, you know, some cheerleaders were down there sacrificing a German shepherd, or you know, like, <laughs> somebody pulled in a generator and had this amazing after party after one of the first techno raids, or you know, like, there's like these great, you know, people hire like you know bums to fight to. The, there are all these horrible. <laughs> but what ended up being is like these legends that sort of surrounded this vacant building became kind of a mirror for like the issues that Detroit was really concerned about, you know. And I'm really interested in those sort of fictions. And so for this project, which is called the Bureau of Manufactured History, we're focusing on kind of taking things that are true, but things that aren't true, and just kind of going... I mean, I keep quoting the 
Albert Camus idea of like you know like the fiction's the easiest way is a lie to get to the truth. You know, and I think what is the personality of a city that distinguishes it from another, particularly as a lot of these very uh, and not bad, but kind of homogenous or unified ideas of like, oh, we'll do bike lanes and mixed use and this and this, and that's good. But like, what is what makes Indianapolis different than Detroit or than New York or whatever? Like, what exactly is that? What is the sort of sense of you know just walking down the street and the kind of like <laughs> static and jive that sort of sums up the city? So that's kind of what, what that's what we want to focus on, and we're coming up with a few different tactics to to, to collect those stories. And I'm really interested in what you guys think about the personality of Indianapolis. So with that, let's, yeah, let's open it. Mark! <laughs> I'm a transplant from Metro Detroit. Uh, you know, dad moved there to work at Ford. Um, I moved here about a year and a half ago. And speaking to that point, you know, beyond the facts, but the personality of the city, uh, I think Detroit has a strong pride. You know, the Motor City pride, the We Built the Tanks at One World War II pride. Um, you know, regardless of what has happened today, that is still there, you know, in people's intonation, the way they speak, you know, the way they say Detroit. When I came to Indianapolis for grad school, um, I had never been and I had no preconception. You know, everyone going to Detroit has a preconception. You could live in India and you have some idea. But Indy, I didn't really know what to think, and I don't feel that same pride um, that Detroit or even in New Orleans, you know, has. And they're a little bit quick to, um, I guess, apologize or just, you know, we're, this is Midwest. It, in some ways, it feels like a really big farm town, uh, you know, with some big bank buildings. And then, you know, there, it's just very different. For as close as we are, it's not like Cleveland, which which feels similar. It's not like Gary, which feels similar. You know, it, it is. it does have its own feel, and we're further south, you know, and it, you feel a little bit closer to the south. and. It's an interesting city. I'm excited to hear what you have to say and what you find about that. Mm -hmm. I would pile onto that a little bit. I was talking to John Beeler a couple days ago about a book I read probably 30 years ago called The Nine Nations of North America, where some Washington Post reporter divided all of North America by kind of uh, local interest as opposed to political boundaries. And he didn't say anything about Indianapolis, but he put it on the map. And it was in the corner of the old industrial northeast, the breadbasket, the Midwest, and the south. It was so Indianapolis was like a border town. And that always has made a lot of sense to me. That the city has felt that way. So we should start selling fireworks, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. My, my, my tagline for Indiana was right, lowest right. price on no cigarettes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say I grew up on the suburban south side, and um, I know there's one other person in this room that, that did this ball. Nikki's here. Um, but, <laughs> but, but, and Becky did too, but yeah. there aren't yeah. that many of us in these conversations right. a lot of times. So mm -hmm. I'm going to say... Mm -hmm. Growing up on the South Side, I hear that. I hear that really loudly yeah. because we are on the southern border, right. Yeah. Right. and and there's a different feeling there. And I think something about Indianapolis that's interesting is people tell themselves stories about what part of the city they live in and what that means about their identity yeah. and their more than even their identity, the relationship to <coughs> other people's identities. So, like, even in Fountain Square, when they don't get their alleys paved, they don't think it's the same problem in Martindale Brightwood, which it is. They think. We're on the side sometimes. I mean, of old timers there. But I've had these conversations right. with right. So, I, I mean, I, to me, that's a kind of ongoing narrative, especially about who, how we think we're placed in the political spectrum of the city. Mm -hmm. I agree. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah, good. Well, I do think, so I'm technically a transplant, but I've been here for 10 years now. Um, and I do think exploring the north south situation um, and how people either talk about that or don't talk about that. Um, is really interesting, especially as it relates to race relations, which has been kind of a topic that's been more public, I feel, in the last few years because of art projects and other things that have happened in public space or not happened in public space. Um, sorry, I'm having a break problem. She's just um, nothing specific, all right? Not specific. <laughs> Wait, what's that specific? Um, what? 
But I do think it's interesting when you talk to people here again about fictions and things like that, there are people who have very strong opinions about um, Indianapolis and Indiana being a northern state, but as you've heard some other people say about kind of we are more southern and especially the south of Washington Street, which is the old national highway. Um, so I think there are very interesting um, kind of topics around people talking about being northern, but if you look at historic policies and things like that, Indiana was actually very southern. Mm -hmm. But we don't really talk about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what I'll kind of play off of that in some of what you were saying, Mindy, at the end it was mixing Indianapolis and Indiana together, and that's what I think one of the interesting struggles is, particularly as somebody who works for an organization that serves the entire state, but somebody who feels very much of this place, is that we're a city that's very much, in many ways, connected to its state and sort of fabricated and created for this state, but it feels very disconnected from the rest of the state. I mean, in a bad way, but I feel like there's an Indianapolis identity and an Indiana identity and they're not really the same. They're, and in many ways in conflict and I feel like I have a sense and I might not be able to articulate what this place is but I struggle with where we fit in with our broader context. <laughs> um, kind of like what we, what we talked about the other night is, uh, is I think other people's view of Indianapolis is of what they view Indiana and where that's positioned, you know, regionally, geographically, things like that. You know, we have this kind of this Hoosier mentality that, that, that um, or kind of similar to that, you know, we, we are representative of the, the whole state. And I think, however, the representation of the state to the other parts of the country is what they think of Indianapolis. However, having been born here, um, you know, I see some of that, but I can't relate to it necessarily. And there's many things that I can't relate to that people grew up in rural northern parts of Indiana. Um, so I feel like an identity crisis. I mean, there are things that I think that define kind of some of the, the culture of Indianapolis. And, you know, it's like kind of like a blank canvas where we have an opportunity to kind of define it. But I still don't know how to describe it to someone who's never heard of it before in their life. Yeah, I'm also piggybacking on that. And I grew up in a small town south of Indianapolis. And growing up, when we were going to Indianapolis, Dad would simply say we were going to the city. And that was just, just we knew exactly where we were going, generally to the south side, because why go any farther north? <laughs> but um, it, one of the myths, I think, that I grew up with was that Indianapolis was the largest city in America with cornfields within the city limits. Whether that was true or not, for us, coming from a small town outside the city, that was kind of reassuring. We liked that. We liked that that was part of Indiana's, Indianapolis's character. And then as I've moved to the city, I've still sort of embraced that and continued to appreciate that there is this um, rural-urban connection that other cities might not have. Again, it might be pure mythology, but it works for me. Um, but it's, it's also, the other thing I was thinking, as, as you talked about the book a little bit in Indianapolis, is another of these sort of um, schizophrenias, I guess you could say, we have is, and you often see it in architecture, although in other kinds of design as well, if there's, really, if there's going to be a really great city, building built in this city, on the one hand we all clamor for, please use a local architect. And then the building goes up and we all say, well, that's crap. They should have used a big city architect. <laughs> or vice versa. We have a lot of, unfortunately, we went through a building boom here when there were a lot of sort of off-the-shelf big firm buildings going up. And we got a lot of those, and everybody said, well, gosh, how come they couldn't have used a local architect? And I think we get this kind of tension in a lot of design areas especially. But I think a lot of times in Indianapolis we have this sort of inferiority complex versus this desire to further our cause. And it's, it's, it creates an interesting tension. I, that's exactly what I was going to say. And I, the latest manifestation I saw was at the Super Bowl, when the lights went out at the Superdome, 
Twitter, my Twitter, yeah. up, lit up with, well, that didn't happen in Indianapolis. <laughs> <laughs> They're super bold than everybody. <laughs> yeah. My, my so Twitter we, lit up with, uh, welcome right. to the third world, as right. I was in uh, so, so, we kind of, so, so we do have this inferiority <laughs> complex, and we kind of get defensive about it. Mm -hmm. You know, we are, gosh darn it, we do have good arts here. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's that, it's that oh, I struggle, like you're uh -huh. saying, in one breath, we'll say we're a world-class city, which implies that that means you're being bringing in and embracing some of the world's best talent, but then in the same breath we'll say, but locals only. Mm -hmm. so, which is it? Yeah. Similarly, we're, um, I think it's this Indianapolis, Indiana thing, there's this dichotomous relationship in that we're afraid to grow and get too big, and it goes to this, this perception of people that live here and the outside perception and, and uh, the Super Bowl helped change some of that for people in this community because we aren't a community that that embraces change very well. Um, so uh, there's this, there's always this no kind of movement to anything that's different. And so if, if we don't want the city to get too big because then we lose our rural roots and we lose our farm Gosh darn it, we have great stuff and we work really hard here and we're awesome people and we're really friendly. Um, so I think there's a, a really big struggle in this town, and I call it a town because we're just a really big small town, um, to, to embrace that and become the world class city. We're, I think there's a, this giant obstacle of, of growing too big or too fast or too diverse or too smart or too... <coughs> Good for our, our own, you know, bridges kind of a thing. So this is it's a really interesting uh, space that I think a lot of people struggle with. Uh, probably less so in this room, but out in the community, people struggle with that. Take one more comment. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I think kind of going off that, I grew up here actually just like three blocks from here and moved away, was away, came back, and I was really excited when I came back. There's all this discussion of how Indianapolis is open up to younger people and to big ideas and this like sense of we're on a precipice. Um, but I think, and so, and like with that, the Super Bowl and with that, people, it not being really, you're not a failure if you're still here, which I think was a <laughs> part of what that, that culture was when I was um, you know, leaving leaving town, um, and but there's still that like holding on to the conservative. Well, we're really glad you have. I mean, and I think I've heard this a lot. We're really glad everyone has these great ideas, but like, let's make sure it works somewhere else before we try it here. Yeah. Um, let's. <laughs> so so like Preach, we sister. want. <laughs> You know, you hear all this really excite, excitement about ideas, about people coming here, moving here with creative ideas, mm -hmm. but people aren't quite ready to step off and and fail. And, uh, you know, we're very, I feel like there's a big fear of failure because sure. we have so much to prove. Yeah. Um, because people feel like they have to prove something, um, that we are worthwhile, that we are a world-class <laughs> city, and if we don't, so there's that conservatism that's mixed with trying really hard to embrace creativity and um, risk taking but I think we're not quite we haven't quite figured out yeah how those live together yeah maybe just as a, a quick summary point so I grew up in Erie Pennsylvania I've been here since undergrad um, and I was shocked when I came uh, to the city how many people asked me if I was a Hoosier or if I was from here? Yeah. The first question anyone ever asked me, and I'd never been asked that. My nobody in Pennsylvania cares where you're from, um, and in Indiana, it it's almost like the starting point as to whether or not you're in or out, or whether or not you're understood, you understand or you don't understand. Mm -hmm. It's the first question I was asked, and I, it was just always so striking to me when I first moved here. Now I'm much more used to it, but... Yeah. I was wondering, can we just do a show of hands? Like, who's from Indiana? That's a lot. Okay. <laughs> or can we do it the other way around? Who's not? That might be easier for me to see. Oh, that, okay. Yeah, that's not so much. So maybe like one-third, yeah. two-thirds or something. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay, I think we are out of time. Brandon's giving me the eye. Yeah, the same question only asked who's from Indianapolis. <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay, yeah, Indianapolis. Okay, let's see. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, thank you, Krista and James. This
really was fascinating. We hit on some stuff I thought we'd hit on and a handful of things I didn't think we'd touch. So <laughs> this was great. And if you guys like this, a couple things, uh, shameless plugs. April 11th, we're going to do another one of these with Oliver that uh, James had referenced, which I think be a great conversation. We're going to do it up at the Speakeasy. Uh, also, if you guys like this, you'll get emails from us. Consider becoming a member of Indian Humanities because you hear about these things first and before they sell out. And we like to do a lot of things like this where we intentionally cap the crowd so we can fill the room with awesome people like you. So thank you, everybody. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. I'll see most of you soon.